are right now in the middle of studies on Persia. And you know the Persians get pretty good press in the Old Testament. We've looked at the first two of four rulers of the Persian Empire that are going to be of interest to us. This morning we're come to the, coming to the character who's known in history as Xerxes. It is generally taken to be the case that the king who is mentioned in the book of Esther, who has the name Ahasuerus, is the same as our Xerxes. The Hebrew word Ahasuerus is essentially the Greek word Xerxes, and so at least the names line up. Esther does not give us in itself a clear and definitive indication that that would be the king, but it's the one that makes the most sense, and certainly the conventional view has been that that is the king we're dealing with. So I'm assuming that. So our discussion this morning is going to involve a consideration of the book of Esther, and also in that connection, the reign and the career and chronology of the events related to this king. There's two alternative hypotheses that are out there. One is that the king that's referred to in Esther is actually Darius, who we looked at last time. That would be a very tiny minority. This is one of those occasions when I'm not in the minority. I find myself in a minority position often. This is not one of them. I'm going with Xerxes. The other view is that the entire story of Esther is simply legendary, that it's something that was written many years later, a kind of concocted story to encourage God's people when they were facing difficulties, probably during the Hellenistic era and maybe related to the Maccabean time and the Maccabean revolt. That, of course, is uh, a view that you'll find with conne in connection to quite a bit of Old Testament uh, material. I'm not taking that view either. You would find that more liberal types might take that approach. I'm approaching this entire course more or less taking the biblical data at face value and just simply saying if it is as purported, and if we take the story and just lay it down like a transparency on top of the chronology that we otherwise are familiar with from Old Testament history, then what do we come up with? And that's what I'm doing here in connection with the book of Esther. So we'll be looking at the story of Esther and the story of Xerxes kind of uh, concurrently this morning. You are familiar with the story of Esther. It was always one of my favorites when I went to Sunday school. It is the story of a young Jewish girl who is orphaned early on and is raised by her uncle, whose name is Mordecai. The young lady's name is not Esther. Her Jewish name is, haha, harder question, isn't it? Hadassah. And she is, however, given the name of the Babylonian god Ishtar, which comes across to us as Esther. And so her name is actually rooted in that Babylonian paganism, but nevertheless, that's the name by which we know her. So Hadassah, a.k.a. Esther, is the one who is the centerpiece of this story. As the story of Esther goes, Xerxes, early in his career, is holding a big celebration. It's taking place over a period of months, actually. That would be typical of what we know about the practice at that time. It's in the third year of his reign. That makes some degree of sense. And along the way, he calls for his wife, who is said in the book of Esther to be Vashti. That's her name. We don't know of any Persian queen named Vashti, but the queen that would co correspond to this was named Amestris. That comes from Herodotus. Again, that's the Greek form of her Persian name. And people who have looked at this have noted that even though our English versions of those two don't sound very similar, they do share a common root and they could in fact be the same person. So Amestris or Vashti, would be the person who is the queen under Xerxes. And you know, Xerxes says uh, that she, he wants her to come and display her beauty, you know. I don't know what was up with that, but nevertheless, Vashti says, no way. And that gets her in trouble. And so you know the story that in the third year of his reign, she is deposed and no more Vashti. We don't have any other record of such a thing happening, but we don't have anything to contradict it. Herodotus gives us a fair amount of information about this particular ruler. He's very interested in this ruler because this ruler fights the Second Persian War. And that's the last great event in Greek history 
in the recent history of Herodotus himself. Herodotus is writing basically during the late golden age, as we say, of Greek, uh, Greek time, about the year 430, 420, and the Second Persian War was 480. So about 50 years prior to the time of Herodotus is when these events are taking place. This is really the centerpiece of his history. He's a Greek, and this is his moment to really spell out how wonderful the Greeks were against those big bad guys, the Persians, you know. And so we get more detail at this point than we might on other occasions. And what we have from Herodotus is certainly compatible with the story of Esther, although he doesn't tell us anything of it. He doesn't say anything that would contradict it. And so we're kind of moving in a little bit uh, through some speculation here, but that would be the case. What he does tell us about Amestris, this, this queen who might be Vashti, is that she was a kind of belligerent type. You know, he tells us that, you know, in other words, the personality that he describes could very well be compatible with the kind of behavior that we find there in the book of Esther. So for whatever it's worth, there's at least a certain amount of compatibility. Then we have a kind of a blank period in the book of Esther. These events take place, the deposing of Vashti takes place in the third year of Xerxes, and then it skips to his seventh year. And that's when he decides to replace Vashti. And you might wonder why it took him so long. The book of Esther doesn't tell us, but what we know otherwise from the history of Xerxes is that he went and fought the Second Persian War during that time, you see. So he's out of town, and now the seventh year is when he returns. So again, chronologically, that, that lines up pretty well. And then, of course, what we have in the book of Esther is a great beauty pageant in which all of the beautiful women throughout the Persian Empire are paraded, you know, before um, Xerxes, and he winds up choosing the one who he deems to be the most qualified for the role, who turns out to be uh, our friend Esther, and so she's chosen. So that's in the seventh year. And then in the, in the twelfth year of Xerxes, according to Esther, we hear about this guy named Haman, who, in a kind of subterfuge, is able to maneuver a strategy to essentially commit genocide against all the Jewish people who are in the Persian world. And the king is induced into signing this document, and of course that would include Esther herself, it would include Mordecai and all of the Jewish people, and that sets the whole Persian world, the Jewish people in the Persian world, of course, in an uproar. And Mordecai communicates to Esther what she needs to do in connection with this. And this is where we pick up the story in Esther chapter 4. So I'd like to read this text to you, and this will be in the back of our minds then as we think about the story of uh, Xerxes this morning. So I'm in the book of Esther. If you're finding your way, this uh, you go Psalms, Proverbs. And so, no, it's earlier than Psalms. Go back from Psalms. It's after uh, what? Nehemiah, Ezra, then we get to Esther there, right before Job, actually. So, Esther chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. This is the word of God. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went through the city wailing with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate wearing sackcloth. In every province, wherever the king's command and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. So she sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her and ordered him to go to Mordecai and learn what was happening and why. Hatak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for the destruction, that he might show it to Esther, explain it to her, and charge her to go to the king to make supplication to him 
and entreat him for her people. Hatok went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hatok and gave him a message for Mordecai, saying, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone may that person live. I myself have not been called to come in to the king for 30 days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast, as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. So one of these wonderful moments of drama, and we'll find out how it ends in a moment. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful to you for this moment in history and for the great lessons we can learn from it. We pray that as we reflect on the career of this Persian king and on the way that you were working out your purposes with your people, even during his reign, that we would be encouraged as we reflect on these things to be all the more devoted to Christ and to have that same attitude of courageous willingness to accept whatever you've called us to knowing that you are the one who holds us in your hand. We give you thanks for it in the name of Christ. Amen. All righty. And it works. So just briefly, you've, most of you have been in the class, and so this is just the quickest kind of recollection because it's been two weeks since we've been together. I just want to remind you of the main bullets. We have Cyrus the Great, best known, most famously known for what? What do we remember him for? And the deafening roar of the response from the audience just knocks over the teacher. He's the one who liberated the Jewish people. Remember that? All right. This is why we like him. He comes, 539, defeats the Babylonians, Belshazzar, handwriting on the wall, and then within a year or two authorizes God's people to return to Jerusalem and re begin rebuilding the temple there. And, her, and Josephus tells us the reason he did that was because he saw his, whole, his own name there in the record, the prophecy written by Isaiah. So we have Cyrus the Great first of all. He's followed by Cambyses, his not-so-impressive son who spends most of his time in Egypt, doesn't like the Jewish people so much, and in fact impedes further progress on the work on the temple, and so it more or less stalls out for a while and remains a half-built temple there in Jerusalem, kind of an eyesore. That continues to be the case under my favorite name, Pseudosmyrtus. Pseudosmyrtus, who's also known as Gamata, who was a Median, is trying to recover the Medo-Persian Empire to Median control and more importantly reinstate the Median religion which is known as Magiism but as it turns out he's not successful because within a few months of his career beginning as the ruler of the Medes and the Persians he's assassinated by our hero Darius the Great who along with six co-conspirators get into the palace. It's a wonderful story. Herodotus tells it in all of its made-for-movies detail. So if you're reading Herodotus, you'll come to that at a certain point and you'll probably enjoy the story. But that takes place in 522. Darius reinstates the policies of Cyrus 
and commits himself to the completion of the building of the temple in Jerusalem. And in fact, we have both Persian records and also biblical records to support that. So the job is finished. As you know, the temple is, is con completed in 516, exactly 70 years after it was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586. And so we looked at the career of Darius last time. And that brings us now to the character that's before us. All these guys are great. You notice that? I try to sell that to my students at school. You know, Gore the Great. They're not buying it. I don't know. They, um... But Xerxes does qualify as great. Gore the Great, not so much. Xerxes the Great, yes indeed. So from 486 to 464, he is our uh, center of uh, interest here. There's two things about him in particular that we want to remember. One is that he does appear to be the, the character who is the husband of Esther in the biblical account. And as I say, the name Ahasuerus, which you read in Esther, is essentially the Hebrew version of the Greek word Xerxes. We call him Xerxes because that is the name that's most commonly used because a lot of what we know about him comes from Herodotus, who's a Greek historian. And we, you know, his Persian name is a little harder to say, and so basically Xerxes is the name that we commonly will use to, to apply to this guy. The other thing that is in, of interest is uh, that he fought and lost what's called the Second Persian War. So I want to look at both of those this morning, the Second Persian War and also this account of what took place in connection with uh, Esther. The final years of his reign are somewhat obscure. We don't have a lot of Persian records to give us information about it, nor does Herodotus tell us a whole lot, except that he sort of implies that the latter years of this guy are not all that impressive and a certain amount of uh, dissolute living, if you, you know, it would be something like that. Now that may again be Herodotus. He doesn't like Xerxes, and so he may be spinning this just a little bit uh, more in favor of Greek uh, perspectives, but we'll leave that at that. So Xerxes the Great, he inherits from his predecessor Darius this huge empire. So if you can see the map, you'll notice off to the right on the map the Persian holdings go clear up and really are contiguous with India. Uh, way off to the right, to the left rather, we have the Persians controlling Egypt, Cambyses that actually successfully taken control of Egypt and Egypt remains under Persian control until Alexander the Great, who is going to still be a couple of hundred years in the future. Up to the north and the west, we have the Persian controlling all of Anatolia, Turkey, and actually having a pretty good sized toehold in Europe. And so all of that gray area there represents the uh, region that Xerxes is controlling. Jerusalem has finished the temple as of 516. It continues in operation all through this period. In fact, the second temple, as it's called, continues uninterrupted the daily sacrifices all the way down to the end of that second temple which is uh, when it's destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, with one exception. There's about a three-year break, which takes place in connection with what's called the Maccabean Revolt. And so the Jerusalem operation is more or less shut down for a time under the Syrian uh, intrusion there. And we're going to look at the Maccabean Revolt and that entire era in th this spring. We'll be looking at it probably in about a month from now. So otherwise, the uh, Jerusalem temple continues all through this time. Xerxes, when he first took the throne, has to put down some revolts. This is not uncommon. We know that a regime change always seemed to be an opportunity for those who were under the thumb of this imperial control to try to seize this opportunity to get out from under that authority. And so both we find in Babylon and also in Egypt, there's an attempt to do so. It is unsuccessful but it does take the better part of a year or two for Xerxes to deal with those rebellions. And so that brings us then to 483, when things have quieted down. Herodotus doesn't give us any of this account, but the biblical account would say that it's at this time now that Xerxes begins to celebrate the holdings that he now has full control of, and this would take place in his third year. The book of Esther tells us that he held a great feast in his third year. Now his third year is 483. We reckon his first year is 485. 
because 486 belongs to his predecessor. So that's the way the chronology is generally reckoned. So if, if 485 was his first full year, then 483 would be in his third year, and that would be indeed when he would be having such a celebration. And in fact, we have some indication that he did have this celebration. What we don't hear of from Herodotus, but we do hear of from Esther, is that it's at that time, for some reason, he wants Vashti to come and sort of display her beauty. I don't know exactly what that meant, and some people put a rather you know, kind of negative view of what the, all of that entailed. I don't know, but anyway... Uh, that's the way the story uh, reads there in Esther chapter 1. As a result of that, Esther, uh, I'm sorry, Vashti is deposed, and that's the end of the account from Esther for the time being. The next big event that takes place in the career of, of Xerxes is the First Persian War. What takes place is in 481, after mustering a huge army, he marches across Turkey and arrives in Sardis. Now, Herodotus tells us this is a one-million-man army. Probably not. Most historians who look at that say that would be not only unprecedented in history, but almost unimaginable. The logistics of keeping a one-million-man army going in this long march and actually carrying them over into the Greek peninsula seems outrageous. And so most historians who believe this does happen, I mean, obviously the Second Persian War took place, but put the size of the army probably more in the range of two or three hundred thousand, maybe four hundred thousand at the most. And so that's what we'll assume. Herodotus is spinning this story a little bit because he's a Greek. And this is the classic David and Goliath situation that he wants to portray for us. Here's little Greece facing this gargantuan attack by the Persians, but what happens? The Greeks win. And Herodotus is very proud of the Greeks, and so he tells the story, and clearly you see that Greek bias coming through, but nevertheless, most of what he gives us is regarded as pretty accurate. So here comes a huge army. They arrive in Sardis, the, the Persian capital, really, in Asia Minor there, in 481. From that point, they send emissaries out through the Greek peninsula seeking for the standard symbols of submission. And uh, what would happen is they would request earth and water. Earth and water stood for the fundamental resources of a particular region. And by sending samples of each back, it was a symbol of saying, we submit to you and we're submitting our resources to you. So these guys go all through the Greek peninsula. Most of these cities they come to freely surrender earth and water. They're not going to pick a fight with the Persians until these guys get to Athens. In Athens, these emissaries are summarily executed and thrown down a well. So the Athenians don't submit quite so readily. And of course, that is picking a fight big time then with the, uh, with the Persians. As a result of that, the Greeks know they have a problem. They have bowed their back. They're not the least bit willing to surrender, but at the same time, they know that they have a major fight on their hands because they know there's this huge army over there in Sardis and that the following year, undoubtedly, they're going to be facing them. They have a big debate among themselves as to whether they should meet the Persians primarily at sea or on land. The Athenians are arguing more for sea. The Spartans are arguing more for a land defense. They have a big debate, and as it turns out, they decide they'll do both. The Athenian naval admiral Themistocles is assigned the, the, the uh, responsibility to handle the naval forces, and the Spartan king Leonidas is assigned the task of handling the, the land forces. Of course, both forces are much, much smaller than this imposing Greek presence, but nevertheless, they're going to do their best. So this is the, these are names I know you're familiar with, Themistocles, Leonidas, these two are the great champions of the Second Persian War. 480, the army crosses over from Asia into Europe. It's a great kind of bridge that's created, quite an engineering feat, and the army marches over. The, the uh, fleet of the Persians hugs the Greek coast, so they're coming down more or less together to attack Athens and to attack the cities of the Peloponnese. And that's, of course, what launches then the Second Persian War. Well, as this force comes along, Thrace, the first region, immediately submits. 
Thessaly immediately submits. Macedon is not, is not mentioned directly, but presumably they didn't put up a fight. And so the Persians march through more or less unopposed. What the Greeks decide to do is to post themselves at two strategic locations. One of them is called Thermopylae, literally means hot gates or gates of fire. And the other is Artemisium, which is a little peninsula out on the sea. And so they're going to post their forces respectively at the land pass, known as Thermopylae, and the sea access there at Artemisium. So what happens, you kind of see how they're forming a defensive barricade at that point. And what happens is the Persians come down and they encounter the Greeks then at those two locations. The most famous battle of the Second Persian War is the battle at Thermopylae. And there was a movie that was made a few years ago, you may recall, called 300. Anybody see that? 300. It was great special effects. Not too far off the actual historical event. They do portray Xerxes a little bigger than life uh, and, uh, you know, Leonidas, who knows, but uh, it's a wonderful movie and lots of fun if you don't mind a lot of bloodshed and kind of spraying guts all over the place. But otherwise, it's a, it's a great, uh, you know, kind of um, entertaining experience. What really happened was the Persians are coming down the Greek peninsula and they're being funneled into this rather narrow pass. Now, the Spartans were by far the most powerful efficient warriors of the ancient world. Everybody knew that. And kind of a fair, oh, let's say, uh, game would be, oh, one Spartan for every 10 Persians. That was essentially what was expected. One Spartan per 10. That's a fair fight. You know, that's how good these guys were. But it was, you know, one Spartan versus 100 is a little over the top. Well, the Thermopylae Pass was a good way to sort of reduce the overall numbers of the Persians into a fairly narrow kind of ravine there, in a sense, so that the Persians would be faced with, uh, you know, in other words, the Persians could only send a certain rather finite number of people through this pass, and that was how the uh, uh, Greeks thought that they could hold them off. They were hoping they could hold them off indefinitely so that the Persians would eventually turn around and go home. Well, they did hold them off for a while. It was about 10,000 uh, Greeks fighting here versus the forces of Persia, which were many, many times larger than that. But then somebody betrayed the Greeks with a kind of back door around the pass of Thermopylae, so the Persians were able to come around and attack them both from the front and the rear. And that made an impossible situation. When Leonidas realized what had happened, he dismissed most of the Greeks to go and fight another day, saving there just the 300. And so that's this famous occasion where the 300 uh, Spartans face the huge, huge forces of the Persians. And even at that, they're able to hold them off for about a week. And that gives the Greeks a chance to run down to the Bay of Salamis, where the major battle of this uh, conflict would take place. So the Battle of the 300 Spartans takes place there. This is what Thermopylae looks like today. You'll notice that it's actually a pass that's right on the edge of the sea. So you've got mountains on the one hand, on the left of the image. You don't see the sea on the right, but the sea level was higher in the ancient world, and so it created this sort of narrow pass where you could only have a few hundred Persians coming through at any given moment. If you drive through this region today, you'll find this great monument that's there, Leonidas and his famous 300 fighting off the Persians. So that's uh, what it looks like. The major battle that takes place in the Second Persian War is at the Bay of Salamis, which looks like this. If you can see there, that little era, the area that's right between the uh, Greek mainland and the Peloponnese is called the Bay of Salamis. And what happened was the Greeks were able to induce the Persians' larger ships into that bay. The more light Greek triremes then just batter away at them. It's kind of a route in which the uh, heavy Persian ships are not able to maneuver effectively, and so that's the end of the story. Herodotus tells us a funny uh, little uh, anecdote about Xerxes, that he was sitting up in the, like in the grandstands, you know. He'd set up this nice little bleacher where he could eat popcorn and, you know, hot dogs and watch the, what he thought was going to be destruction of the Greeks. And he gradually becomes more and more alarmed as he sees that the Persians are losing 
and he knows that if they really do lose the way it looks like they are, he himself might be at risk. So finally, he decides enough of this, and he quickly packs up and heads for home and leaves his forces there to do the best they can, but they do indeed lose this battle, and so it's a big embarrassing black eye for the Persians and a wonderful moment of glory for the Greeks and Second Persian War. The mop-up operations took place the following year in Plataea on the Greek Peninsula and Mycale over in Asia Minor, and that's basically it. That's the story of the Second Persian War. I may have taken more time on it than I should have, but hey, we love ancient history, don't we? Isn't it fun? It's good stuff has really nothing to do with biblical history, but, you know, there it is, and so we'll just include it in our little narrative. The Second Persian War takes place from 481 to 479. As we say, Xerxes returns home, and according to the book of Esther, the events recorded in Esther take place in his seventh year, which would be precisely the year that he would be back in town after the Second Persian War. So again, no distinct records of this from Persian sources, but it very much is compatible with the chronology that we otherwise understood took place. So, in Esther chapter 2, we have a record then of the replacement of Vashti taking place there, and of course in that process Esther is chosen in this wonderful story that unfolds at that point. That's all in 478. Then in 472, we hear about this plot by a sinister character in the Persian court named Haman, H-A-M-A-N. Haman is said to be a, an Agagite. Anybody recall who Agag was? Who was Agag? Does that name ring a bell? Agag? Anybody recall what he was? Where does he pop up? Do you remember? Who is? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, this is uh, Agag is an Amalekite and he's mentioned in the story of Saul, which is many years earlier. And you may recall Samuel had told Saul to go and get rid of the Am Amalekites. They were the perennial enemies of God's people. They had been hostile to them all along and it was kind of like a holy war situation. Go eliminate these people, get rid of them. Saul goes off obediently and makes war against the Amalekites, but in the process says, you know, these are fairly nice people. And they have a lot of nice livestock. And so Saul kind of compromises the command that had been given to him by God through Samuel and saves the best, spoils of war. And of course, it's a great incident, you recall it, when Samuel comes and finding out what, how the war is gone, and he says, what's the bleeding of sheep that I hear in the background, and what is this, you know, kind of deal, and Saul is making all sorts of excuses, but that begins to be the time when Saul's um, fortunes begin to change. Agag was the king of the Amalekites who was spared by Saul at that point, and Haman then, many, many years later, is said to be an Agagite. He's a descendant of these who Saul spared. And of course, the, the lesson that we might learn from that is, you know, if, if Jesus says there's something in your life to, you need to get rid of, then get rid of it. You know, don't just compromise with it and make a deal with it, get rid of it. And so anyway, here they are, the Amalekites coming back once again, more ferocious than ever, and mounting this huge attack, really, and, and a threat to the Jewish people. So Haman is the one who is able by a kind of trickery to get the king to sign off on this order, essentially, that would be genocide against the Jewish people. That is said to take place in the 12th year of the reign of Xerxes. And so that is the moment when then we have this story that we just read of here in, uh, in the book of Esther, in which, of course, Mordecai directs his niece, now queen, in she, at the risk of life and limb, is prepared to go in and confront Xerxes. And if you know the story of Esther, you know that she invites him over and Haman is exposed and eventually hanged and the Jewish people are liberated through all of that. And we have the Feast of Purim, as it's called, in, in uh, Jewish uh, festivals to uh, commemorate that moment. 
The uh, shrine to Esther and Mordecai is found in uh, Iran, it looks like this. And inside you'll find these two kind of coffin sort of uh, affairs that are presumably the uh, remains of Mordecai and Esther. So it's interesting, there's some indication. The rest of the reign of Xerxes, as I say, is fairly obscure. And what I'd like to do then in the time that we have is just return to the thoughts about Esther here. And this is my Sunday school lesson for the morning. So uh, I'd like to have you think about this moment when Mordecai says to Esther that she needs to go in and confront Xerxes, not confront him really, but at least come in and, and represent, intercede for the Jewish people. And notice first of all in verse 14, Mordecai says to Esther, if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. And then he says, who knows? Perhaps you have come to the kingdom, is the word there, for just such a time as this. It's one of the more famous remarks, and you've of course heard it colloquially, maybe you've come to the kingdom for just such a time as this. There was nobody in the world who was in the same position as Esther. She had, by the providential care of God, been brought to a position where she could do something nobody else could do. It's very interesting, the book of Esther never mentions God once. He's never mentioned. There's no mention to some sort of supernatural providential care, and yet providence is breathing throughout the book. All of the timing, all of the close calls, all of the little details show that while God is never mentioned, He's in the machinery all the way through, and I think that's part of the reason it's said just that way. And Mordecai says to Esther, who knows? Maybe you've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. There was nobody like Esther. So my first point in my Sunday school lesson is that there's nobody like you. There's nobody else who is you. And there's nobody who's had the experiences, the moments of education, the training, the wisdom, all of the things that have been accumulating to make you the person you uniquely are is, is shared by nobody else. And there's nobody else in precisely your life circumstance. And I just want to say to you, who knows? Maybe you have been brought to the kingdom for just this moment. You see, where has God put you? What conversation can you have that nobody else could have? What possibilities are in your life right now that nobody else has access to? What is it that's uniquely part of your situation right now that makes you like Esther, Esther a person who's come to the kingdom for just such a time as this? Because we are in God's kingdom, you know. God is building his kingdom, he's building his temple, and we are all living stones within it. And there's no stone that can play the role that you can play. You are unique in that great edifice. So that's point number one. Ask yourself, has God called you right now to the kingdom for just such a time as this? Number two, again from the same text, verse 15. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day, I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king. Notice what Esther doesn't say. Hey, Mordecai, I got you. I'm with you. Okay, I mean, the king likes me. No problemo. I'm going to run right in there and we'll have a little chat. Esther has a respectable amount of fear and hesitation. And she understands what God had said to Zerubbabel through Zechariah the last time we were together, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. So the balancing lesson here is there's nobody like you. You are unique, but don't think you can go it alone. I don't care how many letters you've got after your name, how many credentials, how much experience, how much wisdom, how much anything. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. 
And even Queen Esther, as privileged and honored as she had been, was not going to presumptively invade into this program without being reinforced by prayer and fasting. And so whatever it is that you feel God may be calling you to do, don't think you can do it without that strength that only comes by His grace. Pray, fast, whatever it takes, you know, make sure that as you are pursuing this course, you are doing it with God's sanction and God's power. And then our third little lesson that comes in this very famous comment right at the end. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. It sounds a bit like resignation, but it isn't exactly that, is it? It is the comment a person will embrace that will make them the most courageous. If I perish, I perish. Once you've reached that state of mind, what is there to fear? Now, if you're still hanging on, hedging your bets, worrying about outcomes, you've got some things to worry about. But if you say, if I perish, I perish, well, then the pressure's off. <laughs> Jesus says, do you want to be my disciple? Take up your cross. Not take up your bazooka. Take up your hand grenade. Take up your martial arts. Take up your this or that. Take up your cross. And of course, the disciples who heard that in the first century heard it somewhat differently than we do. We've had 2,000 years to sort of sentimentalize that statement. But they thought about the typical Roman practice of forcing people condemned to death to take up their cross and drag it out to the place of execution, just as Jesus himself was required so to do. You want to be my disciple? Grab your cross and follow me to what you must assume is the place of your own execution. And if you perish, you perish. But the fact is, if a man is going to hang on to his life, he will lose it. But the person who's prepared to surrender his life will gain it and so much more besides. There is in the life of Christian faith and understanding a kind of self-surrender. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Sacrifices usually die. You ever notice that? Sacrifices don't ordinarily survive. And yet Paul uses an oxymoronic statement there, a living sacrifice. If you perish, you perish. It's not so bad. But every day, there's an opportunity to once again take up that cross, to once again go in before the king, to once again know you're putting everything at risk, but to once again know that God in his providence may have brought you to the kingdom just such a time as this so that we with Esther be that person God uses to accomplish his purpose.